I thought heaven and earth is kind of iconic or has this kind of gravitas. You've kind of heard it before, but maybe you can't place exactly where. But I kind of like using titles like that. And then obviously, yeah, I think it was good for this show because it really relates to how the show's organized. So when I decided to hang all these sunset paintings in the top floor with the skylights and the house in the center, it just sort of became heaven. I just thought of it as heaven. I also like using things like a little tongue in cheek, like heaven and earth sort of has this kind of wholesomeness, but upon further inspection, it's not so wholesome or something. So all those paintings of the sunsets on the top floor all have titles that are sort of sinister. They're all based on different opioid, like kind of street names. And so I think that kind of ethos is sort of present through the whole exhibition. Like airbrush as a medium is invented to retouch photos and then starts having all these kind of commercial applications. So it's like pre-Photoshop, Airbrush is the main tool for album covers, novel covers, any kind of commercial art. Also like automotive painting, also set design, background painting. You know, all the backdrops in Hollywood in the golden age, they don't have the money to uh, shoot in Switzerland, so they'll just make a huge painting of the Alps. So I think it's really like the only kind of advancement in painting, like since photography or something. So it really is always in conversation with the history of photography and with you know, the history of representation and mechanical reproduction. So it has this cool history embedded in it. And I think that's like a pretty interesting thing. The sort of digital or social media kind of world plays a, a huge part in contemporary art recently. Realism and art is like becoming more accepted again, partly because of social media. There's a whole democratization kind of populism that comes with social media and realism is really rooted in a kind of populism, which I think is kind of interesting. And then like for me, like on a more personal level, I've just always been interested in the sort of technicality of it, trying to like learn how to do a certain thing or my kind of painting or whatever that I've kind of attached myself to. It's really rooted in trade. It's really rooted in the kind of commercialism. It's all very step-by-step -step and the really realistic sort of hyper-realism kind of stuff. That, that all comes out of like a very specific kind of skill set. Um, that's pretty learnable, I would say. You know, there's like a whole trade like dedicated to that. For me, like that's political in a way. I did go to art school. Art schools intentionally don't teach you how to paint or teach you how to do anything. It's all about like how to frame everything conceptually, especially like at a school like CalArts. The people I studied with are like Michael Asher and people like that, definitely not painters. I was always like a technical drafts, good at drawing and things. And actually like my family, like my uncle was an architect. My grandfather was a technical illustrator. So I have that skill set already, but then like learning how to paint that came later after school. I'm definitely not like a virtuoso, like in the studio by myself, like struggling it out. Everything is very like methodical and planned and organized with other people. It's a collaborative thing. I studied with these great conceptual thinkers, Michael Asher and Charles Gaines, people like this who are really first generation conceptual artists. And I definitely don't really consider myself a conceptual artist, but I have a pretty strong relationship to that lineage. I mean, I think of things in a way similar to the way that they think of things as an approach. I think of painting as like a conceptual problem. I mean, I work on them too, but I also have other people work on them. And so it's like the, the problem of how it gets done is a little less important, I think. But yeah, it's definitely very much like I have the idea, I come up with that idea, and then I find the best way to execute it. And so like same thing with like the sculptures or the video, and then I figure out a way to solve it. I went to school for graphic design before I switched to painting. And so, yeah, I was putting text on business cards <laughs> my first year of college. And just like, 
I don't know, really starting to understand the role and how important, like it's actually very banal, but it's so central to how we experience the world. I mean, it's like you go outside and each sign is, has some level of design, no matter what, like somebody designed it. And that's an active mediation, you know? I mean, there's a context to each sign and there's meaning in the way that it's been designed. Even if it's just Helvetica black, somebody made that decision. Um, and then, yeah, like the signage, you know, like in places like LA or, I mean, S Southern California is interesting because it's the rubric for suburbia. So even though like LA is like a very urban place, it kind of sets the stage for the rest of the country in terms of how the suburbs are organized. The suburbs are bigger than the actual city, you know, so it's actually like bread and butter of America, so to speak. And the suburbs are strip malls. So everything there is like these big kiosk signs that just have like 20 different businesses that have nothing to do with each other. And they're all right there, all in one big thing. And so they become like these Ginsburg poems or something to me, you know, they're like very discordant things just shoved together, but that's America, I think.